Hi everyone, good Friday. I hope that uh, you are doing uh, well. I'm happy to start this lesson and I have to apologize if uh, if in the previous uh, lessons uh, there was a bit of delay in uploading them. I hope that everything uh, is solved now and uh, that you will have the opportunity to follow everything perfectly on time with me uploading all the videos perfectly on time. In the previous lesson, we have uh, discussed uh, about anthropocentrism or the basically the cultural bias in our society, especially in Western society, but also on at the level of the global society, the bias of thinking uh, humans uh, as intrinsically superior to everything else, uh, uh, thinking of humans as ethically and also ontologically essentially superior to everything else. And, including other species, but uh, including uh, the planet, including everything that exists. So it is uh, really important to start with the notion of uh, anthropocentrism because uh, this uh, attitude bias, this cultural bias, deeply influences all our actions, all our actions as individuals, but also our uh, actions uh, as uh, political actors. So um, I hope that uh, so far the, reading uh, uh, the papers of uh, Kopnina and Christ uh, was uh, sufficient to give you a background regarding anthropocentrism and human supremacy as a problem. But now we need to dig a bit more technically into ethics, ethics as a subject. Because at the end of the day, this is a class uh, of environment and society, but it's also a class uh, of environmental ethics. So a class about uh, how we should behave uh, toward uh, non-humans, how we should behave toward the environment, toward other species, toward the non-human animals. So um, I would like to start by clarifying something about ethics. So ethics is the discipline that study the way in which we behave and the way in which we should behave uh, in the world. Basically, we can divide uh, ethics in three macro disciplines. Meta ethics, that is about uh, the um, premises of uh, every kind of ethical discourse. For example, uh, when we think about uh, who should be considered uh, an ethical subject, we sh should we consider uh, animals something we should care about? When we think about this kind of things, we are talking about meta ethics. Then there is uh, um, normative ethics that is about uh, what I should do, which actions are right or wrong, um, how should I behave, how should I pursue happiness, for example. And then there is uh, a part about uh, practical or applied ethics, like more technically what I should do in this precise framework, what I should do in this kind of uh, situation with those kind of variables. So basically, we should think about these uh, macro categories uh, as uh, completely and always in dialogue. But we should also think that sometimes when we are talking about ethics, we are not doing a, a description of how human behave, but we are more focusing on how they should behave. And so we are inside the framework of normative ethics. I am I'm telling you this because mostly, at least today, we will focus on normative ethics and uh, on theory about normative ethics. Another note that is relevant is uh, the distinction between ethics and morality. Some people talk about uh, ethics uh, uh, as uh, moral philosophy. For me, we can talk about ethics and morality as they were pretty much the same, but uh, some people tend to distinguish them. And I've been one of those people in the past, at least, but now uh, I'm more keen to talk about ethics and sometimes using uh, morality as a kind of... Um, um, a kind of synonym for uh, ethics. But overall, ethics is something more secular, more based on empirical evidence, uh, more based on arguments, uh, more based on uh, a democratic environment in which people can express different opinions and we come together deciding what is ethical and what is not. Morality is more related to an historical background. For example, when we talk about Christianity, we can talk about Christian ethics, but we Mm, for example, tend to talk about uh, um, the morality of Catholicism, 
when we talk about, uh, for example, here in Italy, uh, our common morality. So is the is the kind of framework and background uh, on which we um, tend to mm, it's the moral background that we use uh, to decide how to behave overall uh, by default. So ethics is more something we tend to resonate about, tend to be more individual in the sense of uh, um, always trying to self-checking uh, uh, and thinking about uh, if we are doing things right, if we are doing things wrong. Instead, morality is a kind of a default attitude, like there is a morality of capitalism, a morality of Islam, a morality of Christianity, so on and so forth. These are just uh, uh, some uh, notes to before beginning to talk uh, more specifically about uh, the lesson of today that will be split into two, two parts. The first part will be about uh, utilitarianism and the second part about deontology or uh, Kantian ethics. There is also a third uh, theory that is really relevant, that is a virtue ethics, but we will talk about virtue ethics in another, uh, in another lesson. This will be your uh, last lesson of this week. Then you will have the assignment, the discussion board. And I'm really hoping uh, and I'm, I'm hopeful for your comments and your engagement. But I'm really looking also forward to see which kind of ideas you are developing. And um, it is a great moment, uh, the end of the first week, to submit me emails to me or to Anna asking us suggestions, uh, giving us good uh, or, uh, yeah, overall uh, polite feedback in order to help us to develop better this course. As I said before, uh, um, I'm really here to listen to you. I'm really here to engage with you, not to overjudge you. So I really hope that we can build this uh, course together and uh, we can really um, delve into ethics, environment, and society in a constructive way, without um, without biases and without too much ideology, but resonating on the issues. So today, for example, I will present you two major uh, ethical theories. This doesn't mean that I endorse one of the two. I'm just presenting them as they are, so that you can be aware of uh, their implication and you can be aware about why they're so relevant for our time, uh, uh, our historical moment, our society, and also for why they are so relevant when it comes to uh, understand how sh we should behave toward uh, non-human entities in a time of ecological crisis. So um, another thing that I want to say, it's like, uh, yeah, we are doing a class about environmental society. So ultimately about how society composed by individuals interact with the environment composed by non-human individuals and human individuals. So it's about action. And I want you to imagine ethics uh, as something like that. Imagine the planet, the ecosystem, the biosphere as the wooden cabin. And imagine that you have to store in that cabin before uh, the rainfall, dry uh, pieces of wood, dry logs, and you have to store them and no one of them is identical. Basically, this is the work of ethics. Try to put together pieces that are completely unique one from the other in a way that they can fit. So you need to create a kind of a general theory that will work uh, to put, uh, to find a common agreement, a secular most of the time agreement beyond the differences of culture and religion in order to make uh, all these logs fitting into the wooden cabin. The wooden cabin is the planet, the pieces are uh, human subjects. But you should also imagine another factor, that uh, with time, the dimension of the wooden cabin uh, increase, increases and decreases. And this is because uh, we are depleting resources, we are ex extinguishing species, uh, and so things are constantly changing, but also uh, are changing the dimension and the number of the logs because people are dying, people are uh, uh, coming to in the world every every day, and uh, we are all different. We all change our mind, our attitude, our behavior. So it's a constant uh, work in progress uh, of arranging different things. And so at the end of the day, doing ethics is never to give one last theory, but it's a constant updating based on a, a fruitful dialogue with the sciences, every kind of science from biology to psychology. And this is uh, extremely important because science can never tell us ultimately how we should behave. 
and probably no discipline can tell us once for all how we should behave but we can go beyond uh, just mere uh, uninformed opinions and uh, or we can go beyond uh, active um, um, acting just because of our impulses uh, or acting just because we are obeying uh, uh, random laws or um, a kind of uh, common sense but we can do better at the personal and political level by engaging with the science by reflecting through the tools of ethics so um yeah when i said before we have uh, meta ethics normative ethics practical and applied ethics and the end politics but today we will focus on uh, the theories of normative ethics the most important starting from utilitarianism and deontology these uh, theories uh, are models so you should think of them like uh, lab controlled experiment they cannot fully replicate the complexity of life you should take this into account all the time uh, we can never take into account all the outliers all the situations uh, all the problematics that come uh, to define a specific situation that is much 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 more complex uh, than a simple uh, formula that you can apply all the time and this you will see it uh, when we will discuss specifically these uh, theories for example utilitarianism utilitarianism so we can start to dig into it it's a theory that uh, belong to the broader framework uh, of consequentialism consequentialism put it uh, in the simplest ways is a philosophy and ethics that focus on consequences more than principles so consequences take priority on over principles basically when we think about our actions we should not look upstream toward uh, uh, some golden rules but we should look downstream toward the consequences uh, in the next close future to the uh, long-term future but still we should look downstream at the consequences uh, one of the most famous uh, example is from Peter Singer, famous uh, not just for uh, his uh, utilitarianism, but also for animal liberation. Peter Singer and many other controversial uh, topics. Peter Singer uh, invented, coined the experiment, the, um, the mental experiment uh, of thinking of a child uh, that is um, dying, uh, drowning in a pond and thinking about uh, what we should do if we see a child uh, that is uh, drawing, uh, drowning in a pond. We, should we um, get our feet wet uh, to save the children? In uh, the opinion of Peter Singer, absolutely yes, because at the end of the day, it's better to have our feet wet uh, than uh, to sacrifice the life of a young uh, person. Why? Simply because the consequences uh, of this uh, of the action of saving the life of the children are much better than the consequences of not saving the life of the children even if it, this costs uh, to the person uh, to have uh, his or her feet wet and this pretty much is applicable to everything climate change we have a cost in intervening now changing the structure of economy we can get our feet wet and this means something very rad very concrete very uh, substantial like for example having higher cost uh, for of um, fuels or uh, paying more uh, when it comes to electricity and so on or traveling less or eating less meat so it has consequences but on the other side it saves us from much worse consequences like uh, for example uh, the destruction of entire habitats uh, the rise of sea levels uh, the change and the breakdown of the climate system and many people may be dying or being displaced because of it and and this is to pretty much to give it the consequences uh, perspective you can do the same kind of uh, reasonment when it comes to extinction to save a species maybe can cost us resources money engagement but on the other end uh, it preserves the possibility for another life form to thrive and maybe to provide us ecosystem services uh, to enrich our lives our cultures to give us uh, aesthetical experiences or even just because a species uh, is an, an entity that has uh, intrinsic values um however um utilitarianism is a specific form of consequentialism a specific form of consequentialism that um, um cannot give us an absolute moral principle because nothing is absolute 
but can help us to wait uh, and decide uh, how to act in singular different occasion. Let's say that the aim of utilitarianism is to maximize the good and minimize the bad. But how can we decide what is good and what is bad? The, um, one of the fathers of uh, utilitarianism is Jeremy Bentham, philosopher of the 1748 uh, 1832, and he says that uh, maximizing utility should be the goal. Maximizing utility is the way in which you should look at the consequences, which are the, the best action is the action that will cause as a consequence maximization at the level of our knowledge of uh, the utility. And the utility can be also named as happiness. And what is happiness? Utilitarian, utilitarianism gives uh, a very material explanation of happiness. Happiness is the presence of pleasure and the absence of pain. Pretty straightforward, and we can also call it hedonistic utilitarianism. Hedonistic utilitarianism because it's a pleasure-based uh, uh, utilitarianism. And this is great for a, a, per a certain point of view, because uh, at the end of the day, um, happiness can allow us... Uh, if based on pleasure and avoidance of pain, to relate and take into account also non-human animals. For example, if we think about a dog or a cat or a sheep or a cow, we can clearly see that they have an interest in avoiding pain and uh, pursuing pleasure. And so from a certain point of view, um, utilitarianism, contrary to other ethical theories, is less anthropocentric if we take uh, into account, for example, the consideration that we have done in the previous class about anthropocentrism. However, what does it mean to um, pursue happiness and pursue pleasure can be a problem. And uh, a more recent philosopher, Robert Nozick, uh, for example, criticized um, utilitarianism, this kind of utilitarianism, saying that there is something more than simply pleasure and pain, because, for example, if it will be inside uh, uh, a reality matrix-like, like the movie Matrix, in which we are attached to an experience machine that is providing us uh, the best, uh, the best uh, situation with friends, with lovers, uh, with a career, with everything that we can desire, uh, seeing so much wildlife, eating so much uh, um, of what we like to eat, um, whatever living in the, our perfect political system, being the kind of person that we want to be. If we will be attached to this experience machine, Nozick uh, says, we will experience the, the highest amount of pleasure and the lowest amount of pain. And yet most of the people will say, okay, but this is not uh, the reality. This is not true. So I don't want this. I prefer reality. On the other hand, we could take... Um, would respond to Nozick by saying that uh, probably what will cause us uh, issues is the knowledge that we are attached to this machine. But what if we will not know? If we will not know, we will desire to prefer our life, uh, maybe uh, an ordinary life, maybe a working class life, maybe a life of um, on an oppressed subject, uh, contrary to this um, uh, fake reality, if we will not be aware that this reality uh, is fake. I don't know, I'm not sure, I want uh, your opinion, maybe you will elaborate more on this, but undoubtedly one possible response to Nozick is that we value reality simply because we know that it's real. If we will not know that it's real, probably we will be pretty pretty fine with Matrix. Uh, or uh, another possible um, reason why we will prefer reality is because uh, someone can think, okay, I'm attached to a machine, I'm living a perfect life, what if at a certain point I have to go back to reality, I will never be able to live anymore in reality. Yes, these are things to take into account, but I think that these variables can uh, change uh, the outcome of our response to the um, to to Nozick. So the matrix like experiment uh, and the fact that we value reality is also because we can have uh, a reality anxiety. The idea that what we're experiencing is, uh, experiencing is not good enough simply because it's not real, it's not permanent, uh, and so on. And then it depends also who you are and. Uh, how well you are doing inside reality. This can be also converted in many experiments, like about taking a magic drugs, the magic drug that will make you live a perfect life rather than experiencing the true reality, etc. So there are many possible experiment, uh, experiments uh, in the way in which Nozick uh, is criticizing utilitarianism. Another um, thing that we should consider is uh, about a good life. What is a good life? 
uh, I think that uh, um, utilitarianism is uh, going so well uh, right now together with uh, liberalism because both liberalism and utilitarianism tend to leave open the question about what is a good life because one can say it's the pursuit of pleasure and pain perfect but what is pleasure is not something that is identical for everyone undoubtedly there are basics uh, um needs uh, there are basic needs there are a basic uh, um standard of what you should be a good life uh, for example uh we need food we need to rest we need certain comforts we need to avoid diseases and so on but uh, still uh, about what we like to do in our free time how we like to establish relationships how we like to um eat uh, to spend our free time this is a uh, something that varies a lot and uh, both liberals and uh, um, people that uh, follow the utilitarian uh, the utilitarian ethics tend to agree that good life good lives is something very subjective um and also uh, there is a uh, something very important because uh, utilitarianism is not uh, telling us uh, uh, about how we produce uh, the pleasure and this sometimes sometimes something that people consider problematic because we can pursue pleasure by doing things uh, that uh, are not uh, good, at least from uh, uh, a non-utilitarian standpoint. We can consider, for example, that there are things that can give pleasure to a person that are not uh, something that we should uh, like to see, that uh, we would uh, endorse, for example, torturing animals, even though utilitarianism could reply yes because you are not taking into account enough uh, the pleasure and pain experience um, experienced by for example these animals subjects so there are possible um, uh, criticisms and possible uh, responses and uh, we are not here to summarize everything will be impossible even in a class entirely about utilitarianism but it's important to reflect uh, and try to stretch our minds uh, while we deal with this kind of uh, theories that as a, as we have said before are theories uh, not uh, they are models of reality they can never fully represent the complexity of our actions that sometimes our actions are based on a theory sometimes they are based on more than one theory sometimes there are actions that simply um, tend to live uh, in a space of ambiguity in which basically whatever we do we feel like uh, there's nothing exactly wrong or exactly right and that's pretty much okay uh, we can always do better we can always find a better way to reflect on different issues and different practical problems still uh, we don't need uh, to have always all the solutions and always to have a perfect uh, uh, map of reality we just need a map good enough uh, to orient our action in a way that allow us to live better in common with other people and non-human people as well. Um, yes, as I said before, one strong point in favor of utilitarianism is the capacity of uh, taking uh, into consideration uh, both uh, human and also animal um, pleasure and pain. And I think that this is really relevant and this is why for example, uh, utilitarianism was super successful uh, with, uh, together with anti-speciesism, veganism and animal liberation, uh, also animal rights movement uh, of every sort. Even though we see that also Kant and deontology were influential when it comes to animal liberation and uh, environmental ethics. Sometimes we tend to apply um, a kind of a twins uh, uh, theory to political decision that is inspired by utilitarianism, that is the cost and benefits analysis. Uh, this kind of uh, cost and benefits analysis tend to decide to how to make uh, new laws or to take political decision out of if uh, and when to approve a project, for example, based on a cost and benefits analysis, they're trying to quantify the goods and the bads of every situation. For example, we can um, try to um, survey the possibility of people, uh, uh, the desire of people to maintain uh, a certain ecosystem or to maintain uh, and preserve a certain species by doing uh, uh, a survey based on the willingness to pay. This is a very trend uh, things that uh, people do when it comes to try to define how much we value something. The problem of the willingness to pay, 
basically asking to people, how much would you pay to have um, fresh air in your uh, country, fresh air uh, in uh, your city, in your town, or how much would you pay to have wolves uh, in, uh, in this forest uh, or have this kind of fish uh, in this lake? The point is uh, the bias here. I know that they try to quantify to find like a, a number, a way to be as objective as possible, yet there are biases and definitely there are also ways to try to circumvent these biases. But one important bias is that most of the time people tend to be um, to scale how much they will pay for something according to how much they are concretely in their every, everyday life able to pay for um, for basic goods, able to pay for um, for their desires. So sometimes uh, your class, uh, your status, uh, your job uh, uh, influence in a very radical way your capacity to judge uh, um, to judge something as uh, good or bad uh, or to tell uh, to to people how much you will be in favor of something because sometimes to be in favor of something is also a matter of economic status i hope that this is clear enough because i think that is a very important point because uh, one of the most uh, difficult issue when it comes to when it comes to approving uh, or being on the same page with the uh, utilitarianism of uh, consequentialism is like how we can objectively measure consequences especially when it's not my action as a singular individual but is an, an a cost and benefits analysis of the government or a governmental organization or a non-governmental organization a university so on and so forth there are a few major critics that i want to tell you before concluding this video and then you will see me in the second part talking about kant and the ontology and uh, the first one is um, is that uh, unfortunately, fortunately, it depends, but nothing is ruled out in principles. For example, if we have to pursue the maximum good, we can also think that uh, killing, torturing, uh, abusing, also, for example, abusing animals can be something uh, doable, can be something legitimate. And there is no way that uh, a theory based on consequences can rule out uh, entirely these uh, options unless you try to build an hybrid system which you take account something more than simply consequences or you take into account uh, consequences only in a certain way so you need something more elaborate than simply the classic utilitarianism the other is the problem of uh, distribution because distribution is not taken into account if the golden rule is to maximize as much as we can pleasure over pain and if we have to maximize happiness, uh, how can we quantify and compare it? Uh, is it better one person super happy and uh, other people living in a bad but acceptable way? Or is it better for people living a good standard of life but no one of them super happy? And then, for example, is it better a planet of 32 billion humans uh, living uh, a pretty shitty life but still uh, enough, good enough to be lived? or uh, it's better to have 4 billion uh, people on the planet and living uh, a super good life. Uh, and so how can we do, and how can we take uh, into consideration other non-humans? And uh, when it comes to other non-humans, uh, um, how can we compare? It's already difficult to uh, compare a different uh, um, form of happiness and uh, combine all together different experiences and see what is good and what is bad when it comes to humans but if we take into account all the species if we take into account all the at least the non-human animals that we know that are sentient and so they can experience pleasure and pain leave alone for example other lower maybe interests of uh, plants and fungi um, so how can we do it this is a a problematic approach and we need to take into consideration the other is a preconditionary approach in the sense that um, sometimes uh, it's not just about that when we do cost and benefits analysis we should favor something just because the benefit seems uh, uh, higher but sometimes it's better to just be, have a precautionary approach because things can go wrong and this is for example the case of uh, building nuclear technologies or other kind of um, evaluation because sometimes for example if we talk about geoengineering 
uh, if we do a cost and benefit analysis to develop a technology or to make a political choice seems uh, mm, a good bet but in the end of the day it's still a bet and if things will go wrong uh, the consequences will be very bad and if probably we do just a cost and benefits analysis we will have the idea that the, the possibility of things to go wrong are very low but still this uh the matter of probability is not good enough and sometimes we need to say no we cannot do such a thing simply because uh, it's better to not gamble in the first place and so probably we should follow a precautionary approach so this is a general summary of uh, utilitarianism as we say there are criticisms there are much many more criticisms but uh, these were the most uh, the most famous and the most relevant, I would say. Undoubtedly, there are advantages, for example, the capacity of uh, considering uh, non-human animals uh, um, and their experience of pleasure and pain. However, now we'll, uh, in the second part, try to discuss the ontology, uh, Kant and Kantian ethics. Um, in other words, we will go uh, in the other opposite direction. We will stop to look downstream and we'll start to look at the spring up in the mountains where principles uh, uh, live. Thanks a lot, take a break, take a coffee or a glass of water, relax your brain, meditate on what I've just said, and then uh, you can start the following video.